are coming. It's, it's, um, we have a great crowd here. Um, I thought I would begin, of course, with you, Belinda, because okay. this is your concept and, and this is, you, you know, you put this together. Um, and it's a very intriguing title, I think, you know, self portraits and places. Yes. And I think the places is actually kind of a very important part of it. I mean, we, we think about self portraits, but this is, maybe you can talk a little bit about that, okay. places. Okay. I have to say, um, you know, when you're in the studio, which I am daily, and you're thinking, you know, you're thinking, and you're thinking out loud, and you're thinking just about artists you respect, and what it takes to be an artist. I, I would say a painter, but you know, I'm biased that way. Um, <clears throat> and it truly is about yourself. It's a very egotistical view. But self is not just what you, you know, we have, as I said in my little blurb there on the wall, we have our, ourselves that we, our narratives about who we are, you know, how we look. Are we going to wear this today? Are we going to, do we feel powerful today? Do we feel stupid today? And it could be all those things in a day. Then there's the mythologies of ourselves, like, you know, I'm powerful, or I'm going to someday I'll be famous, or, you know, all these mythologies that you have. And then, there's your physical surroundings, the place, the way you make something, the, the way you live, the way your, your place is, which tells, I believe, a great deal about who you are, the books you have, which chairs you prefer. Do you like things cluttered top to bottom? Do you like nothing? Do you like clear space? What, what do you like? Do you like to have your dog with you? Do you have a dog? <laughs> um, all these things make up the self. So while I realize stylistically these are very different, they're absolutely, completely about self from where I sit. So, that good? That was very good. Okay. <laughs> and before we turn to the artist, I just also wanted to, because you are a painter as well, although again, a painter of, of work that's very unlike Right. This work, right. and so as a as a curator, when you put on your curator hat, how much of your painter self do you bring to that curating? Good. I Question. think it's I think it's 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 so innate that I don't that I didn't think about it honestly. I thought about work that hit me here with my concept and my premise. Then I have to say, just technically having tried to do <laughs> some of the real respect, real respect. So I, um, th so that's how it landed for right. me as a painter person. Right. I have a yeah. huge amount of respect for each of these artists. Yeah, because I always think it's interesting when a, when a, a, a painter or an yes. artist curates, it, it's a different kind of eye, I think. It was a real marathon it was a real marathon mentally and emotionally to kind of clear things and get everything straight mm -hmm. and installation when it was mm -hmm. meant to be tell the story of each. It was, I loved it and I will never do it again. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we're lucky to be here for this. One time. Yeah. Well, I mean, and, and as you say, the, the work. You know, when one first walks in, the work had, all of the works here are very different, obviously. But that's why I, I thought it was so interesting, the places, because what's clear in all of these works, you know, is that there is a self, that it is not the sort of unitary self, you know. That oh, that's this, true. Yeah. I hadn't thought that. Yeah, that in, oh. in, in all of them, the self is, is you know. In a space. Yeah, in a space and extending to this larger world. Um, and so, I, and, and although, you know, that larger world is sort of different and, and maybe we can, well, tease out some of that, both the similarities and the differences. And I want to start with, with Brenda's work here. Um, because, the, you know, the idea of a self-portrait, of, of, of 
um, you know, artists doing self-portraits. If there's a long lineage, it's, you know, um, you know and, and they do it in different ways, although very often they are in the studio as, you know, your, you know some of your figures are here as well. Um, but they, they certainly present themselves you know, often, you know, as a kind of, in a more authoritarian, authoritative way, you know, they don't, they don't have the kind of vulnerability that these do, and part of that, of course, comes from choosing to uh, depict yourself nude, but there are also traditions of, you know, there's, I, I'm thinking of Alice Neal's, you know, self-portrait, where she's, she's an old lady, you know, and, and she's kind of just looking at you, kind of challenging you, um, you know, it, it's a kind of different vibe. She did one. You're right. She did one, but it's it's a, but it's it's a very different vibe, you know. Or Lucian Freud, you know, also painted himself in the nude again, mm -hmm. you know. But it's there's something more, you know, confrontative maybe. And what's interesting about these is, you know, first of all, you, you, the face is generally obscured or hard to make out, which is you know very often the part of the self portrait that's very important to the painter. Um, but also that there's a vulnerability here. I mean, they're they're really, um, you know, it, it's. I mean, you talk about self exposure, but, and I, I'm wondering what brought you to to do this, to do these kinds of works. <laughs> I promised oh, I would try and say something. <laughs> these particular ones. Yes. Yes. There was the. These two were done uh, on this back wall in 1991. And these all were done between 2003, the first one on the left, to 2007, which is me and our dog. Um, what I was interested in doing, you could see it most in the, uh, the one of me in the studio, was before I started doing the self-portraits, which I've done on and off throughout my very long career, I uh, was doing a lot of abstract, mostly abstract paintings. And when I decided I wanted it to be more personal, and I was up to about no more than 200 pounds at the time, I wanted to deal with my body. I, you know, was. I, I was using my body sort of as a mirror to deal with the weight, and um, that was just one small aspect of it, but it was an important one for me. Um, it, was in, it was important for me to challenge myself, not only to paint my, the ones that were done before this were much more abstract. You could, you could see from those, <clears throat> and even that one on the left, and, I was much more vulnerable doing them more naturalistically than when they were more abstract. But one of the other things that I wanted to do was to bring in some of what I was doing with abstraction in the studio with like the canvases all piled up and against the wall and uh, the two on the bottom. So I was wanting to play with some of the abstract elements too and not just go to something entirely different. And, uh, and in each one I was making up a painting. I think I was making a Joan Snyder in that one. <laughs> <laughs> Whoops. <laughs> and in that one, I don't know who I was making. Um, but I'm, in that, that one, uh, in the corner there, is the only one of all of them I did with clothes on. Mm. And I have no idea, I mean, there was something that was so wonderful about being big in terms of painting. I understand how Rubens felt. Mm -hmm. um, but then after I lost the weight, I have absolutely no and oh <laughs> interest in painting myself again, especially <laughs> almost turning 80 in a couple of weeks. So uh, this is it. <laughs> <laughs> but it was weird, you know, when I reflect back on like, why was I nude in all of these? Lisa Luskevich just did a series of the artists in their studio, and I said, I was doing these in 2003. Hey, where were you? <laughs> so I, I don't know. It was just, um, I, I did feel more vulnerable with these, but 
And in the first one in the series, there are some, there's four where I was wearing a head covering because it felt more, uh, and then after the fourth one, I took the covering off and felt like, well, it was okay. Uh, it was, yeah. Mm -hmm. They're beauties. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, one of the things that I think unites all, again, all three of you artists is this, you know, that sort of art history is woven into the works, you know, as you were saying, you know, um, you know, there's Joan Snyder, you know, there's, um, you know, Rubens. The, Rubens, definitely. And Rubens. Giants, I mean, they're, yeah, and, and I think that that's kind of, you know, of course, artists are always looking to um, other artists, you know, but but maybe there's, it, it's interesting that I guess art history for all three of you is a kind of, I don't know, a language or a lens through which to get to go into yourself, you know, that you, you, you know. Can I just jump in with yeah. one thing from when I was curating and I knew, I knew from the, I knew that I was going to approach Brenda and see if she'd say yes. Yeah. There was, the, that, <laughs> that's the most honest image. A person, you do it as well, but you do it with all this, ta-da stuff. This is like, there's, there it is. I mean, and she didn't make herself pretty mm -hmm. at all. Mm -hmm. And I also think it's very about, you know, we could go on, I probably could go on for hours, but the psychological being mm -hmm. absolutely naked in front of your work. Physically, as well as if you're doing it right, or well, emotionally. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> that's the truest I've ever yeah. seen with yeah. someone that I can actually touch and know who isn't like 5,000 years old, <laughs> so. Yeah, I think that's sort of what I have done. When I used symbols for years, I was painting what was going on in my life and what was good and what was awful and my dysfunctional childhood and, you know, the work has been like from my emotions or wherever I was at throughout my 60 years doing it and sometimes like the last show they were very abstract but and I got scared that I wasn't showing any emotion and then someone said to me but they have humanness in them mm -hmm. and I said oh I can continue painting <laughs> <laughs> and it was really important for me to remember that because I was trying to let go of because these self-portraits really hit you in, in the gut, and I did that for a long time, and I got a lot of uh, recognition for that. But I don't always feel like, especially in the last 10 years or so, that that's where I want to be. Mm -hmm. I don't need to be. I've you know, worked on myself forever and in all different ways, and so I just moved to a place that felt you know, it was less emotionally in the, the gut to be able to be okay as a, as a painter. And I just wanted to say something yeah. you were talking earlier yeah. when you first started yeah. about um, your, your work is abstract and you picked, you know, all figurative work. I've done uh, several trades with people and inevitably I pick minimal work by these artists and they pick my work because it's real painterly. Hmm. And it's just, it's just, you know, again, something, yeah. why is that? Yeah. I mean, we um, don't have enough time. And, <laughs> no, but it, it's, it's true. Like one of my most, uh, almost on the top or the top uh, painter is Mirande. Mm. You, you know, you could, right. there are little Mirande right. touches in that. Painting, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, I can see, I, if we, but yeah. you wouldn't think of Mirande. You would think yeah. of De Kooning, Soutine, yeah. whatever, whatever. Yeah. Yeah. And yet, the, the paintings that sometimes I'm extremely mm -hmm. attracted to are yeah. really good conceptual or minimal right. uh, paintings. And, and so it's interesting, it's just interesting how that happens. Well, I think, again, as I was saying, to art history, you know, it, it, it's, um, yeah, it's like a lens, and I, I, which is a, it's a good segue, I think, to Julie's work, of course, because, you know, there is such a, a, a depth of, of knowledge of art history in your work, um, but sort of presented in a kind of light way. And now here again, we have, you know, we have some naked, you know, some nude self-portraits, but they're self-portraits in a sort of different way. And in a way you're putting yourself, partly you're putting yourself in sort of, there's a sort of lineage, I think, of art history that you are 
you know, very much a part of. But also, you know, whereas Brenda's work is, you know, is, is in these, yeah, kind of Mirandi-like studio sort of spaces, but yours is full of kind of, it, it's, it's nature, it's sort of becoming one with nature in a way. And so, um, yeah, I'd, I'd love to sort of hear about where, you know, your work comes, this, this you know, as your sense of self, because these are these are more allegorical, you know. These are definitely kind of very allegorical images, but they still are personal. How do you, you know, how do you balance that? Where, where's the self? Where's the, or, or is there a distinction between self and, you know, this other kind of fantastical world that you're creating? Well, I have to say, I never think about an allegory. Um, I do think about creating a world that that sort of is suffused with something, you know, mm -hmm. something that I could I think I I go glimpse a sense of meaningfulness in, but I never name it. Mm. Um, but, you know, I do uh, want everything to cohere, so I mm -hmm. guess that's where the allegory comes in. But I was thinking, you know, listening, you, you had, um, I, 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 we, we had asked if there were going to be prepared questions, and right. you had said, no, let's make it casual. So, you know, we didn't come in with anything prepared to say, which means that the first thing that comes to your mind is what you're going to talk about. And what I was thinking about when you were asking the first question was, you know, how I never was attracted to um, the self-portrait. Self-portraits are kind of a lowly genre, you yeah. know, and compared to, you know, hey. history <laughs> 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 paintings or abstraction. Dog meat here. You know, it's like still lifes and, and self-portraits are considered, it's what, what women did. We're, we're talking about, yeah, kind of the, the hierarchy of genres. The hierarchy of yeah. genres, exactly. Right. Um, and you know, what did I know about it? But in, as an undergrad, um, I had a teacher I was very enamored with. Um, I went to UC Santa Cruz, which somebody else went to. And, um, and this was a visiting teacher from the East Coast. He taught at Cooper Union. And, and, he, and I had, you know, I was a diligent student paying my dues to rendering, and I would render these things, and he had no interest in them. And so finally, in this desperation, because he would, he would like work by the other students that just seemed to me kind of, you know, mucky and murky and whatever. Um, but then in desperation one day I did a little murky, uh, little portraity thing with my hands actually inside my skin. It was very, you know, cornball. But he actually, you know, he responded. And, and it, you know, it was a pivotal, stupid painting. You know, you gotta do pivotal, stupid paintings. Um, and, you know, it, it sort of made me realize you gotta dig in. So then graduate school came, and it was also um, very difficult for a semester, and I was, you know, in a crisis. And in my tizzy, I just went to the, just took off my clothes and, you know, painted myself. And so it's always been this, this um, lodestar. Mm that you know that you you come back to um but then the realization that it was the antithesis of all the heroic um you know minimalist abstractionists that we well that you know i was taught to revere um you know all my teachers were minimalists and abstract abstract expressionists so to do this this you know i think of them as is coming from my Catholic upbringing, the little saints, the holy cards that I would just imagine my way into, these, you know, St. Lucy holding her um, eyeballs and St. Agnes holding her breasts. I, that was wild stuff. That was powerful yeah. stuff. <laughs> it's wild <laughs> stuff. Really powerful yeah. stuff, yeah. yeah. And so, like, that compared to an all-red painting, like, I don't care about an all-red painting. I care about Lucy's eyeballs. Um, <laughs> So, um, yeah, so I think I, I came at this backwards. I did not want to make self-portraits. And, and in the beginning, just really quickly, and then I'll be done, they were not, there were no figures. It was these still lives with these um, projected mind's eye images on them that I would call self-portrait as disaster area with no figures. Um, because it was just clearly like, you know, me looking at my psyche. And so self-portrait is wreck or whatever. And then slowly, you know, one little figure made its way in, and then the figure got bigger, and this is what you get. Right. Anyway, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, and, and I mean, the thing is that, it, again, it's a sort of language for you to talk about a lot of other things. You know, I mean, you know, the works yeah. that deal with, you know, some of them, they, they deal with climate change. You know, some of them deal with um, violence against women. You know, you have these. Can I but, just stick? Yeah. Because I, I hate to interrupt, but I'm 
I'm gonna. I Go guess. for it. Um, one of the things that Julie's work has always held for me is you you know you walk in and you go whoa like how and then if you have had art history training or you've worked in the studio and you're a painter and you, you go oh I have, okay and this and and then they're not pretty when you get in there they're not they're not pretty there is some scary stuff going on but the thing it makes you do is pause long enough to look to to notice to look and you go well, that I that's a, wow that's a creepy thing right. that's a dangerous thing mm -hmm. which does reference the climate right and she's been referencing the climate for a lot. what 25 years or yeah. something yeah. yeah a long time and now of course we're in it. And in now it. we're there. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, right continue. Yeah. I just... No, thank you for that. Cause I remember reading um, Dave Hickey, and he, he talked about, you know, beauty. He brought beauty back into the conversation. Right. thinking, oh my god, beauty. Because I was trying to be every other kind of artist. and then, But beauty as a, I, I think he talks about um, enfranchise, it, it enfranchises a viewer hmm. so that the, the yeah. more subversive content can right. reveal itself. So thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> I mean, I've always gone, yeah. like I just said, that then you look at, that's a scary plant, or the dogs are practically mm -hmm. killing each other. Mm -hmm. It's, But you first look at it and go, oh, mm -hmm. oh. Mm -hmm. Isn't that, a, that's a rust. That's a, that's <laughs> a, um, that is a scary plant. That's a scary it's plant. An apple rust, some kind mm -hmm. of horrible bacteria. So you know um, more than I, I just went, this is something's not right here. a scary plant, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, nature, it's not just sort of nature as this, sort of beautiful bucolic thing. Yeah, and it's nature that can turn on us and nature that we are also turning on. So it's, yeah. Um, so it, it, it's, yeah, you create these worlds, these, this, this world that is ours and not ours, and it's subjective, but it's also outside. I mean, it's, you know, it, it exists, you know, in, in multiple places, I guess. Um, and, yeah, I mean, it's, um, and the, the, the female figures are also kind of very interesting because they feel, you know, they're kind of archetypes also. I mean, they're, you know... They're definitely they, not me. Yeah. No, yeah, I don't, I don't paint myself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, there's a resemblance, you know, because I guess, you know, they, for many artists, the, you know, most convenient um, subject is you know, yourself in the mirror. You know, you can look at that person. You don't need a model. But they, yes, they are these archetypes, these, these different kinds of archetypes, sort of female archetypes. And um, well, or male, the first one. Or male. That's true. Yeah, that's true. Because yeah. I loved his weird little face. Yeah. Yeah. yeah exactly. Yeah. yeah. But but and but this kind of um, yeah merging, I guess, these archetypes that are sort of merging with nature, merging merging with these the sort of larger world. But then also, I, I mean, subjective. I mean, how do you you know again sort of self is the name of the show, the self. Where do where's the self? I, the, you know, there will be faces, or there there are compelling faces and less compelling faces. I, I, you know, the first time I saw the Infanta Maria Teresa by Velazquez, I just was so smitten by what a sad, vulnerable face she has. I mean, she just she looks she she wears her weird position in life. She was married to Louis the Sun King, you know, and she was this. I mean, Louis the Sun King with his all of his voluminous. And she was this humble religious woman. Um, I mean, what was that? You know, with the crazy wig. So I, I loved her face and just wanted to merge with it. You know, and then and then I loved Queen Victoria's face and wanted to merge with it. And I loved Philip the Fourth, his fourth face, right. and you know, merge. Um, that's what we get to do. The, war, the studio is our oyster. Right. Is it a little so, Cindy Sherman-ish, you think? I, mean, I, I don't think about her, because um, she, she takes on um, uh, pop culture types. Right. And I think I'm much more interested in, um, uh, you know, people from long ago right. that, are, sure. that are late. But there is that, still that merging, which is yeah, interesting. Sure, yeah, sure, sure, sure. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah, and so, uh, now, <laughs> Eliza, Joe, it, and, and I think this was a very interesting inclusion because, if, yeah, first looking at it, you think, oh, but wait, so this, these are, where's, there's actually no people in these. And yet, 
they are very personal also because there's this kind of, you know, in, in a way, there, there's, I guess, sort of a metaphor, the in, interior you know, of the house, the interior of, of the, the apartment, there's sort of very, in, you know, kind of intimate domestic interiors, and there's this sort of sense of inside looking out, or at least that's kind of what I get, and a sense of, you know, I, you know, in, in some ways, the outside world, because that, the, almost all of them have windows, you know, or, you know we're, we're looking out into this world, and there's something a little bit um, maybe foreboding, difficult about that outside world, as if we maybe don't want to, come, you know, to leave it. Um, so, yeah, maybe you can talk a little bit about that, sort of the inside-outside dynamic, and, and again, subjectivity, and, and how you, you find your sub subjectivity in these paintings. Yeah, well, I, I started these paintings um, during the pandemic when we were confined yeah. <laughs> in New York City, and it was a terrifying time. Um, we were in, you know, when the pandemic began, I, I went to my studio, which is a 10-minute walk from my house, and grabbed all my stuff, brought it home, and started painting at home, because we weren't even supposed to be going out for a walk, you know, and that was went on for months. Um, so I started painting inside. I had been making bigger, kind of more mythological paintings, um, and so I hadn't painted so kind of in a fo such a focused way small images for a very long time. In the beginning, I just looked out the window because the light was so magical. It was spring, things were blooming, but we were all stuck inside. Mm -hmm. And it would be one thing blooming. I had the Brooklyn, you know, row house, and it, a lot of those row houses are sort of there's a something that blooms in March and then something that blooms mm -hmm. in April and that's, you know, it just keeps going like that. So there's always sort of a spectacular event with the color and the light. Um, and I just started to paint that. And then as I was, and the first paintings were quite small, eight by 10 inches. And then um, I started to back up a little bit and think about the, the interior and the exterior. So it, it was really about, um, just what you said, the kind of... Can I just jump in again? <laughs> just a little bit. Um, when I looked at these and chose these, for me, at that time, I didn't really reference the pandemic so much when I chose these, but I, there's one on the staircase in the morning, I think, and that it, it was just like, it, I had that moment. It made me feel that moment, that instant where you, it's 6 a.m., the day is ahead of you, you've got the optimism, but now I know you have the pandemic, and you're, this, so your house is your world. It's yeah. your whole world. And that was an optimistic world. And I felt it, I, I sort of viscerally felt how it felt, to wake up and go, oh, it's six in the morning, oh boy, and then reality. Happened. Yeah, yeah. It's um, the point of view of that one is actually from me lying in bed, <laughs> so oh. staring to the hallway. Wow. When light comes in the skylight and it turns the hallway this green, I didn't. I don't think I got the color. It's a color you can't even have to Catch. paint that color. <laughs> right. um, but it happens. It was happening every day, and then I, you know, just I became obsessed with it, so I had to paint it. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think all, all the paintings are inspired by moments of light. Um, the light transforms the space. And um, I also, at the beginning of the pandemic, started reading Bachelard's Poetics of Space and really start to think about the house as like a head. The room is a head. Right. The windows is eyes. Those are, those are eyes. great. Uh, Louise Bourgeois, where she literally you know, has her head is a house. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. So, and then, you know, there's this sort of you know, the house becomes skin. Mm -hmm. um, so I've been thinking about that a lot in terms of um, just the emotional content. Yeah. And then there's this conversation in some of them, like the more recent one is the one on the far right with the bright green outside. Mm -hmm. So I started to think about conversations between what's inside and what's outside mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and that they, they're kind of overlapping but almost having a conversation. Um, and then there's one in the way back, which is actually from my parents' house, where there's these little lights that are across the river and at night that look like 
eyes. Yeah, your eyes here. looking back. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, so it's not just you looking out, but yeah. Yeah, it's a little spooky. Yeah. But, uh, well, one, uh, one of the things I wanted to kind of ask all of you um, has to do with kind of the, the role, I guess, the role of feminism, you know, do you see the works as, as I mean, to me, all three of the, you have, there, there's sort of this sort of strong kind of feminist point of view, or, um, and I'm, you know, I, I, you know, part of it is there's that long tradition of the kind of, we call it, talk about the male gaze, you know, this was, you know, um, and that one of the things feminists did was to challenge that in part by creating a female gaze. And I think that all of these are very much a, you know, example of a female case. But I wonder if you could talk about any kind of your sense of, of um, I guess, the importance of feminism or lack thereof. I mean, how do you feel about these works situating them in, in terms of kind of the larger sort of feminist, um, you know, kind of philosophy? You're looking at me? I'm looking at you. <laughs> it's, it's like, that was not where I have ever really been in my work. Mm -hmm. Though I do think about feminism more than I ever did. Uh, I can reflect back and say, yeah, those guys got all the favors and I didn't, but you know, I was my teacher's pride and joy, so I didn't really care <laughs> whether I was uh, uh, it just hasn't ever been part of my experience. But the, and there's I, a lot of people who are trying to make it that way now, you know, well, um, being asked into queer shows and all of that. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I guess I, I want to think about feminism in a broader sense, not just, you know, that so sort what's of identity. The, what's the question in a broader sense? Well, in the, in the sense that, um, you know, this is, you are, you are, it's a very different gaze. It's a very different way of looking at yourself. That I, I don't think a, a male artist would ever paint a painting like this. Um, you know, and we, you know, I mentioned so Lucian Freud did paint himself once, naked, but yeah, it's a, he did. yeah again once. But um, yeah, it, it's it's not well. Partly, it's it's not vulnerable. It's it's it, you know, there there's sort of um, I mean, you the way that you kind of let us into your world, I think, is, is very different than the way that, it, there's a kind of generosity, in a way, um, to the way that you are looking, which one would not so, I think, of, of, one would not expect, perhaps, from a male artist looking, doing a, a self-portrait. I, I saw a hand over well, here. Well, yeah, again, yeah. <laughs> um, because I have to say that it was, well, partly this conversation right now, but bubbling along for many years, since the 80s. I've had feminist tendencies, <laughs> and um, they, they've gotten, they, you know, I, I chose these artists because of their confidence. Not, I didn't go, I'm going to only use women. I didn't say that initially. But when I came to choosing the work, it was women and their work that I responded to. Mm -hmm. And I also have to say, <laughs> like, I'm two things. I'm tired and I'm pissed off. So this was, you know, this, these, are, these are powerful, confident mm -hmm. painters who also happen to be women. Right, yeah. I, not Julie. Well, I, I, I think it's it's the idea of you know your 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 central face is blackened is you know basically hooded, and you're giving way to the multitudes. Um, you know that's kind of the awareness of the multitudinous nature of our experience is I think you know something that I, I you know everybody's aware of, but I think women especially are aware of because you know we're always. Feeling what each other's feeling. I mean, you know, yeah. the loosely speaking. I don't We're just think. wired that way. Well, well, there are people that might, you know, argue with this, but it, in my experience, you know, my feelers are going out and and taking in my environment the way that that painting is, you know, suggests. Um, and yeah, it's certainly it's never about these features, you know, how these features come together. Um, it's, it's the multitudinousness, and you know, you're as well. You've 
completely decentered herself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, and I mean, in, in your work also, this you know, okay, first of all, just you know, the domestic environment has always traditionally been associated with women. So you're kind of taking that, owning that, and and transforming that. But I'm curious. So do you feel that you know that the sort of female gaze, the feminism, informs you? Maybe not deliberately, but is it is it a part of what you're getting well, at here? I suppose it is. I mean, I, I, um, I've painted the figure for most of the time that I've been a painter, I refigured the painting abstractly. And when I left school, like very powerful teachers who were figurative artists, um, and I felt like I had to find a way to paint the figure that felt honest to me, that was a kind of imagery that I wasn't repulsed by, which would be like, um, the human experience of that I I feel like I feel like Brendan Brendan's paintings get at that completely the human experience it's not a sexualized woman mm -hmm. right um, that's a good point that's a really you know, good point so I think all your painting your your abstract painting and your painting is so completely human it's so completely personal um, so I set out to find a way to paint a figure um, that meant something mm -hmm. you know, that dealt with Right. Human condition. Right. Kind of way. It might be just a, a few bikers biking around the city, right. or hipsters in Williamsburg, or but not often somebody sitting in a chair, you know, right. posing, or you know, nudes or right. stuff like that. Because there's enough painting like that. Right. I don't have to contribute to that. <laughs> you yeah, yeah, don't yeah. need another one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. One of the things that I wanted to do in my work since almost the very beginning was to not have a a wall between me, the viewer, and the painting. Mm -hmm. And I think I can go to a show and say, I don't trust these. Mm -hmm. And I know I'm right, because mm -hmm. I just feel it. And I can feel when someone has really has taken risks or has put something out and it feels real. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things I've tried to do in my work throughout my whole career is to not have that that wall between the viewer mm -hmm. and me. So what you see is what you get, and I'm no different, mm -hmm. you know. And I, it's just something I think is, a, it is generous. But I'm not like trying to be generous. It's just who I am, you know. Mm -hmm. So yeah, to to bring us into that. Well, and I think all three of you bring us into this. I agree. Yeah, very much so. Yeah. And I just. I just want to reiterate one final time, I promise this is the last one, um, the, the courage that all of these painters have. And it, they all, although they don't, Brenda said it beautifully, I think they all do, they're, I, nobody is apologetic in any of this work. It's very, here I am. And circling back to the feminism issue, because we are, most of us, we have one baby in the group, <laughs> um, what, most of us are of a generation that has been at it for a long time to just simply want, you know, we just want to be noticed and heard. And we have the stuff, mm -hmm. and we don't. And all of these artists have it, and they they're all very successful. And honestly, that's another reason I chose them. I was like, this, what you see here, what they have done with their lives in the arts is harder than most people know. Mm -hmm. What it takes right. to really get the recognition and to keep at it. Right. Good and bad reviews, whatever. And, and one thing I was thinking also looking, at, you know, is, is that we actually kind of represent three different generations here. So it's, you know, you know. Well, we're kind of related. Yeah, well. Yeah, and they all just. You, you know, <laughs> depending on how we define a generation. But, and, and so, I, yeah, I was just, I was thinking about how, and maybe each of you could talk about that as well, how, 
Well, first of all, you, you had mentioned, Julie, you know, that you were, you found yourself up against this kind of abstraction thing. You, you were supposed to be doing abstraction. You know, that was the thing that you were, you know, your teachers were telling you that you had to do. You know, kind of how did you, in, in each, and I think it's different in each generation, maybe how you have to define yourself. I think all three of you defining yourself maybe, uh, you know, against or with or against this, this other prevailing art world. Like for, for you, Brenda, you know, did you find yourself you know, when, when, when you were kind of coming of age as an artist, you know, this, this need to, you know, kind of push against, what you were probably pushing against was maybe different than what Eliza's pushing against and what Julie's pushing against. What, I mean, what did you find yourself pushing against, I guess is the question. I would not to sign my name Brenda Goodman. Huh. I signed it B. Goodman I because I didn't want to be in a box. Mm -hmm. I didn't want to be, known as a woman painter, or I'm just, I'm B. Goodman. Mm -hmm. I'm a painter. Yeah. Period. Right. So at that, because you felt, especially I guess at that time, that it really would have, yeah, yeah. people would not have respected it in the same yeah. way. Yeah. 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 It was just knee jerk. Right. Yeah. If you sure. said Julie or Elis Elisa. Yeah. Yeah, I'm pronouncing it wrong. Oh, I did it for. Oh, it's Elisa. Elisa. It's Elisa. Elisa. Okay, sorry. sorry. I thought okay. it was Elisa. Oh God. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, okay. it's it's just. Uh, I did that too. I'm just Stickney Gibson. I never put Melinda. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Although I'm pretty it. sure Stickney Gibson gives it away. I I, I was <laughs> Jane Everton for a while. And well, when did you when did you switch to Brenda? Oh, a long time ago. Well, right, you just gave up on uh, right, trying to be like right, 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 1970. You know, well, a long so, time ago. So short. Yeah, me too. Yeah. So what are you, so what are you now? I'm, well, how do you sign your paintings? I actually, Jay Hepperman. Okay. Just just because you know it's it's a quicker. Well, if flourish. you've been at it long enough, and that's how people just then you do it that way. Yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah. if I started putting Melinda. Well, for one oh thing, my gosh. It, it's a whole graphic <laughs> element to paintings that you don't really need. <laughs> then I always yeah. sign on the back for the same reason, so that I'm not, there's no identification about who made it right from the well, start. Well, that's part of what happened. I mean, and Philip Gustin always signed his paintings on the front, so the around right. it came a time in the, you know, sometime in the 80s, probably the late 80s, when people started signing them in the back. I can't remember the last time I signed a painting. An on actual the front? On the front, right. No, it's been since this hmm. a long time ago. Now, Lisa, you do represent a, a younger generation. Do these, do these comments resonate with you at all, or do you feel that things have, no, I mean, have things changed? How do you, how did, you know? Uh, well, you know, I think that, yeah, I think. How do you send your paintings? Oh, I send them on the back, my full name. Your full name on the, the back. Yeah. Well, it's a complication yeah. to this little story. <laughs> yeah. Because I feel like the painting is its own unique Me thing. Too. And I don't want to put some, you know, signature on it. It right. seems weird. Right. Um, but it was traditional in the past. But, you know, people can find out whose paintings are whose now. It's not like living in the dark ages. Right. Right. <laughs> yeah. Really? But did you ever have that feeling of, uh, I mean, did you have, you have the feeling that you needed to kind of disguise your identity at, at any time in your career that... No, I didn't really think about that. I mean, you know, I was pretty much ignored for a really long time after I went to school, so I just was told, you know, it's ambition for the career, of the art, not the career, so I went to my studio and I worked really hard. Mm -hmm. So, like many artists that were, you know, friends of mine, we just were off in the corner. It wasn't until later that I realized, oh, it's really hard to get attention when you're painting, when you have a body of work and then you're ready to show it, and then you have to go out there and find a way to do that. And I do did find that some artists had a lot easier time than others. And um, some artists are just better at it. Yeah, they work at it. And yeah. Maybe um, I might be a little bit more of a hermit, as you can probably tell from my paintings. <laughs> but um, yeah, no, it's you know, it you know, it, it was a weird time when I was kind of coming out of school too, because. Um, Figure paintings were kind of looked down on, mm -hmm. and it was thought to be backwards. And mm -hmm. you know, this is in the 90s, and, the right. or, and, and for a while, I did paintings of my children. Um, and I, the comments that I would get from people when I said I was doing a painting of my daughter, was painting my daughter, would uh, be like, "What are you thinking?" Like the thought, right. I was like, 
a hobby painter. Yeah, how can you be serious? <laughs> how can you be a serious? <laughs> well, and but this goes back to that kind of notion of this, you know, the, the hierarchy of, of genres and the ones that were more associated with women, you know, right. yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, were less, you know, they, 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 were, they were seen as lesser in a way, yeah. you know, so that if you were going to be broadly ambitious, you know, you had to, in a way you had to sort of erase your gender as much as possible. I mean, that, you know, that was, I mean, I, is that something you ran up? But I, I, I mean, thank God we're over that. Yes. Yeah. Right? Right. Yeah. <laughs> we hope so. We hope so. <laughs> um, yeah. But, yeah. So, but anyway. Um, well, thank you. I don't have any other questions, but I hope that the audience does. So uh, let's, shall we open it up to the audience? I have a question. Yeah. You know, what I find very fascinating about the show is I would call it an exploration in the deep subjectivity. And I, I wonder if you could talk a little about the, uh, this dialectic between the superego and the id. Oh, and how difficult you're kidding, it. right? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. How it is to face things that most people are too afraid to face. Huh? And the fact that we are multiple selves, not just two. Well, as I said earlier, that was part of my premise concept for the show was that we are all not just figures or we have we have the places we live in and we have I didn't I'm not trained I you know I've read young but I, I'm not trained but I did come with an eye that thought deeper than just what I saw I did think about what the artist was what the artist was doing, and that they, it, these are very personal, they may not agree, but for me as a curator, they're very personal, labor-intensive investigations into self. They just are. I mean, you can paint an apple, and it can just be an apple, but if you bring all of your self with it, People will look at it, and it's the weirdest thing to me, but this actually happens. I'll have people look at some of my work who know nothing about art, and somehow they pick out the good ones. <laughs> and I don't know how that happens, but they know. So I would say it's the same thing with the show and the feeling about self. And I hope that's adequate for you. <laughs> do you, do you see, what do you see in terms of that? <laughs> What do I see? Yeah, in terms of the your question. Um, I think it's very courageous to write it, to actually face um, an image. I mean, these, these are very tough images to be asked to, but in a more digestible way. But, uh, yeah, it's very hard to acknowledge what you are publicly and stand by it. Because most people go to therapy to find out what that is, then they then they automatically hide it. They can't it, it, is a, it is a weird question. What, what is, everybody knows that they have to get past the pretty surface. Um, but how, how do you make, how do you make the deeply um, repulsive, because that's what we're looking at when we go inside, what, what repels us, how do we make it, I don't want to say palatable, but um, how do we make it something that other people want to share the experience of looking at? But that's what happened in an interesting definition of, of, the, of the listening to crime stories that he wrote. He thought that they were an exploration into the superego id. The uh, detective is the superego and the, cr the criminal is the id. Hmm. And it's a total... Hmm. Nice. The, the story is about checks and balances, about trying to check those things inside him. Yeah. But he made it a creative act, and I think the relationship between crime and detective is very much like that. Mm -hmm. And I think these could be put into that category. Did, did you did you say before? I may have misunderstood you that you thought Julie's paintings were more digest. No, I think they're th digestible I mean, than my it's, painting. It's, it's, I think it's a different kind of representation, but a very similar question. They, they are for me. I mean, it's interesting you use that word, that they're, these are not 
easily digested, <laughs> given the subject matter. <laughs> Do you feel that way? I'm just yeah, curious. I, I think these, these works remind me of Maria Lessig. Yeah. Mm. yeah that, That's good. Um, and she is a queen of people. That's the name I'm just trying to. But they don't, they're, they don't look anything, anything like her, her work. No, but she, we might be coming from the same place. Forms. I mean, I think that's what's interesting about this show. Yeah. This question comes in many forms. I haven't looked at the ladies back in fact there, but, the, but theoretically, I get it. I mean, that they can be interiors, they don't have to be figures to explore that. In fact, the apple. It's not an apple you're looking at. Right. Right. That's a good, thank you. Okay. All right. Um, any other questions? Uh, yes. First of all, thank you very much for the wonderful show. And um, I find that with these fellow portraits, one of the wonderful things I get from, from them is that they represent what we all feel, and that is to be not afraid of who you are, which is a real lesson as an artist. And then um, the other thing, oh, and it reminds me mostly of two artists that weren't afraid to be themselves, and that was Bill Gustin and also Clara Coleman. And, um, feminist idea. What helped me most uh, in terms of feminism is when I saw the show of women artists from the Renaissance that I never knew that there were Italian women artists from the 1800s. And, and for me, I thought, how could I be an artist when they were never any women artists? And I also read uh, that there, in excavations in southern Italy, they found recently a painting of a woman Hmm. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Um, yes. Uh, this is a moral comment and a question. I, I, one of the things I really appreciate about the show is that there, there's this dive into the self and a very, very personal. Uh, they also transcend a kind of solid, fixed sense of self. And, and I, none of them are about um, locating a self as a fixed identity. Mm -hmm. And I really appreciate that. Yeah, that's very true. Yeah. <clears throat> and any other comments or thoughts? Mm -hmm. Yes. I had a comment. I just really enjoy this painting. I do find it really cool, actually. What I find interesting about it, too, is that with all that's going on, I want to look in her eyes. Mm -hmm. Huh. And, um, it kind of has like this Midsummer Night's Dream kind of thing, and then I should say it was like a cedar rust. So it's kind of a yeah. psychological thing. With gold. It's, it's beautiful, but yet there's this, um, like the, the closer examination you see, there's a menace present. Very much. So, uh, and at the same time, it's very beautiful, and the, like the clothing and her, her shoe falling off. Landscape below reminds me of like a little bit of like the background of the Mona Lisa with all. Mm. So I just yeah, I really enjoy the painting. Thank you, and I have to give um, uh, credit to my partner, who um, you know it's really great to. There, there's a famous painting by Courbet, uh, the artist in his studio, and there's the nude model and there's Courbet, right. but it's full, it's a room full of people, and I I always hated that painting because he seems so arrogant and like. He's painting a room you know, full of big, huge audience. And then one day I was listening, painting and listening to NPR as I do, and you know, all these different voices, smart, smart people, and realizing, oh, wait a minute, that's who they are. They're his NPR. Um, you know, anyway, so, you know, Jonathan, my husband, um, he wanders in, and the painting was, you know, pretty much almost done, and he's like, he's a theater critic. <laughs> so he's looking at it and he's saying, something's, something, you know, it's, it's all great, but, the, but it, it sort of falls apart at the bottom. And um, she needs to be shedding something, losing something. It's like, oh, oh. thank you, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so you need a theater critic in your life. Yes, so. <laughs> um, so yeah, I don't know if the shoe idea was yours or mine, but it really, you know, this is like, we were the, the art, the, the studio art where you do it all alone 
is so ridiculous. You know, I mean, I'm writing a graphic novel and I'm working with an editor, you. and she has like comments. Mm. And you know, writers they work with yeah. editors and theater people. They all work together. Musicians they all work together. Only stupid artists <laughs> work alone, <laughs> and and it's awful. So it's not hard. unless they have a partner with a really exactly. good eye like I do. Well, exactly. 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 Then, then, then if you don't have that, you are really alone. You have to try and make studio. That would be me. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> we'll come over. And I'm happy. I'm happy that way. And yeah. I was reading at the. I, I I know it's like the end of it's fourth. Is it the fourth of July? Yes, the fourth of July weekend. And I know everybody has things to do, but I'll just say that. I'm probably the last person in Woodstock to read um, Night Studio about mm, Philip Houston. You are the last person. I am. I'm sure I'm the last person. <laughs> and I was reading the last chapter today. Two things. Earlier in the book, it talks about, I thought it was just me. Like someone said earlier, I thought it was just me that all I want to do really is be in that room. and. As a married person at the time, I kept being told I had to go out there. I had to be out there. And I would go out there and I would have a great time. But I would, couldn't wait to get back to that room. And remarkably, these three artists here have partners, long-term partners. I could never do that. I just couldn't have the um, whatever it was. I don't know what it was. But it, I was reading, and Guston was the same way. He was apparently hated all of the other stuff. And he had a long-suffering wife who basically <laughs> gave up her life and to a him. a long-suffering daughter. And I had nobody who was willing to do that for me. <laughs> they were like, they had their own ambitions. And it didn't work. And I have never, I finally come to terms with, I am happiest, really with no NPR of any kind, <laughs> um, on my own in that room. And I honestly don't know why I said that and brought that up. <laughs> it's just that it, 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 it does, in fact, inform some of my choices and who I chose to include, because they feel they have this powerful sense of self. All of them, as different as they are, have that. And I, you know, I could blah, blah forever, but I could spot it. I knew it. When I saw it, I knew it. So I had to defend my premise a few times because people were, you know, they're so different. That's the point. You know, that is the point. So that's that. Now we can all go ahead. Well, I, just real quick, I know we're, we're at, at time, but I just want to say that Eleanor's book is the most amazing oh. book. I, I give it to, I, I, I assign it to students uh, all the time, but if anybody hasn't read it, it, the art world is a gangly place with a lot of things that make no sense, and she organizes it and gives a context, this historical context for contemporary art. It's such a good book. So everybody should get that book. All right, well, thank you. I have to go. <laughs>